Hello, I'm Herman Aguinis from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. And I'm Bob Vandenberg from the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. We're delighted to have this conversation with you about our article in the Annual Review of Organizational Psychology and Organizational Behavior titled, An Ounce of Prevention is Worth a Pound of Cure, Improving Research Quality Before Data Collection. We wanted to give you a behind the scenes view and some background information on our article. We hope that you will enjoy and find our article useful, but wanted to give you some background information on what led to us writing this article. Both Bob and I have extensive experience as editors and reviewers. I was editor of organizational research methods from 2007 to 2000, 2005 to 2007. Then Bob was also editor of the same journal from 2007 to 2010. After reviewing so many articles for ORM and many other journals, we came to the conclusion that the vast majority of papers that are not accepted for publication, are not accepted for publication because issues are related, there are problems related to the theory, to the research design, and the measurement aspects of the study, not to the data analysis aspects of the study. Usually data analytic issues can be solved if other aspects of the paper are strong. So relying on a famous saying by Ben Franklin, we titled the paper in that matter because we believe that the critical part of any research study is what is done before we collect the data, not after. Personally, I admire Ben Franklin. He was not only a scientist, but also a diplomat, a military strategist, and a very successful entrepreneur. So when we talked about how could we title the, the paper, for us, it was an easy choice to rely on, on Ben Franklin because we personally admire him. The uh, paper itself um, focuses on seven key elements, if you want to call them the ounces of provision, uh, prevention um, that uh, we allude to in the title. And so just very briefly, uh, the first one is making uh, meaningful theoretical progress. And uh, by that, in the article, we are um, questioning whether or not uh, the current state of affairs in terms of the published articles are really making that much progress. And then we provide editors as well as authors pieces of advice as to how they can make it more meaningful. Um, for example, editors could put their theories more at risk or encourage more risk taking in terms of testing the theories. Um, an example for the author would be extend, extend the null hypothesis beyond just the point zero zero, but be more challenging in terms of the, the uh, level at which they're going to test their hypotheses. Addressing an important question is the second one that uh, we talked about in the article. Um, this really improves uh, the chance of making a meaningful contribution uh, if you do this. Again, for the editor, our advice is to really sit down and question whether the, the so what in the paper is being addressed in, uh, in terms of its meaningful importance. For authors, uh, most of our advice is basically networking, getting on editorial review boards, um, uh, uh, reviewing for conferences, um, relying on colleagues to review their papers. Um, the third piece of advice is, is there a practical end in mind in terms of the outcomes and results? So often we focus on the testing the hypotheses for the sake of testing hypotheses with little thought as to what is the practical outcome for this for the organizations that we purportedly study, the workplace and the people within the workplace. Um, so for editors, one piece of advice we give is the research socially oriented. Um, can we answer questions that are of importance to the organizations through it? For authors, one piece of recommendation we get is if they have a sabbatical coming up, why not spend that sabbatical in a business shadowing managers and actually learning the nature of business rather than going to another university. The fourth uh, piece of advice we give is addressing low statistical power. Um, so many of the studies that we reviewed, um, by the way, uh, I think Herman and I figured out we have uh, 100 years of reviewing <laughs> experience between us in the various editorial boards, but, but a huge problem uh, and has been for a number of years is low statistical power. Um, and to be quite frank, if you have low statistical power, um, 
your findings are inconclusive. Uh, so for editors, uh, we tell them to insist on power analysis, and for authors, we tell them to, to conduct the power analysis in advance. Um, the fifth one is strengthening inferences about causal relationships. Um, this is basically design issues, and uh, it comes to the questions of how confident can an author be that the, the, the thing that they believe is the cause is really that and is really uh, having uh, an impact on the outcomes that they would like to have. And again, because of so many of the designs that editors and authors are using right now, that um, is a questionable practice. Um, the sixth one is using control variables appropriately. Um, again, because most of our designs in the organizational sciences are non-experimental, control variables have been pushed by editors and others as a means for re uh, removing alternative explanations. And again, however, a lot of, there's a lot of mispractices with respect to using control variables, and we provide some advice to the editors and authors for doing this. And the last ounce of prevention is improving the validity of the measures that uh, authors are incorporating in their studies. Um, again, we've seen and witnessed a lot of slippage lately in terms of the measures being able to measure the things that the authors purport that they do. And uh, what we're calling for, again, from both authors and editors, is to engage in more meaningful um, measurement design practices. And so as, as Bob mentioned, uh, for each of these issues, first we describe why it is so important. Then we offer it specific advice, almost in the form of a checklist for authors, researchers, and also editors and reviewers. The reason, or one of the reasons why we see the need for these checklists is that there are two broad trends uh, that really are pushing us, researchers in the organizational sciences, in what seem to be opposing directions, but we see them as not being such. First, the pressure to publish high-quality research that is published in top-tier journals. Uh, the competition for publishing is becoming fierce. It's global. The majority of top-tier journals have rejection rates of about 90%. Tenure, promotion, another reward structures in many universities are based on the number of articles published in such top-tier journals. The only way to get into those journals from the perspective of authors is to conduct high-quality research. And as we said earlier, this only happens if you plan your study, if you think about the theory, the research de design, and the measurement issues. When you get to the data analysis uh, facet of a study, Typically, that is not a fatal flaw. Things can be fixed about data analysis, but not about the prior, prior steps. The second big uh, trend and pressure that we see uh, is to conduct research that has uh, important implications in terms of practice. How can we conduct research that is not only high quality, but also actionable? Business schools, psychology departments, universities overall are suffering the pressure from external stakeholders. They need to show that they do relevant work, that their research produced has important implications for the betterment of society, organizations, and the people who work in those organizations. So the only way, we believe, to conduct research that will be actionable is to do high-quality research. So again, the pressure to publish high-quality research in good journals, the pressure to produce knowledge that is actionable. Those two things, we believe, can be more successfully accomplished if we pay attention to the uh, things that need to be done before data are collected. And, and kind of continuing with the same theme, um, you know, one of the areas that we are very adamant about is making meaningful theoretical progress. And, uh, it seems to us that um, so many, with the push by our top journals to um, um, make every empirical piece have a, a unique theoretical contribution, what we have is a growing garden of, of plants and weeds with nobody there to thin them out. And um, so we spend a lot of time in this particular piece talking about how we can make meaningful theoretical progress by actually putting our theories at risk 
coming up with test uh, hypotheses that are um, a very strong test hypotheses, and um, and through that, um, hopefully, begin to weed out this this garden that we're seeing. Another one of the issues now going into some of the seven issues we discussed in the paper is what happens at the very beginning of most research studies, which is we ask a question. So the, one of the issues we discuss in the paper is the need to ask an important question. Typically, the rationale for a study that is this has never been done before is not a good rationale. There may be a very good reason why something hasn't been done before, because it is a silly idea that leads to a dead end, or it has no practical implications, or no implications for theory. So the first step is asking an important question. There's a nice story about the uh, team at Los Alamos who was in charge of creating the first atomic bomb. There was a scientist who was a member of that team, Richard Hamming. He passed away in 1998. He was a founder of the modern field of computer science. He asked one very important question. His task as a member of that team was to ask the following question. Will the atmosphere burn after the first atomic detonation? In other words, would the entire atmosphere and therefore life on Earth cease to exist after the first atomic bomb? We didn't know that. So when you ask such an important question, it doesn't matter if the answer is right on. If you get an answer, any answer, to such an important question, the research will lead to a good contribution. So how do we come up with important questions in our research? In the article, we offer many ideas about this. But overall, the issue is to gather information and scan the environment, following the motto that the more knowledge I get, the more creative I become. So attending professional conferences, engaging in conversation with researchers from other domains, reading papers, serving as a reviewer, are some of the ideas and recommendations that we offer. Uh, overall, uh, Bob has been leading an effort over the last few years on an issue called myths and urban legends, methodological myths and urban legends. And the idea is that there are many uh, methodological practices that, that have been passed on without being questioned so much. And, and this is also an impetus for our article to try to deal with some of those things, like the issue of this has never been done before, which is used so many times as a, as a rationale. Our counter proposal to these myths and urban legends is what we call a revolution with a solution. We point to things that should be done better but also offer solutions on how to do that better. So in our article, in particular, in the case of asking important questions, not only we bring up the issue, but also offer specific solutions for that concern. And the thing is, you know, we address seven key issues uh, within our article, but um, that is just too few with respect to a lot of the other issues that we saw out there. And, um, as Herman alluded to, um, myself and a colleague of mine at the University of Georgia, Charles Lance, we've been collecting these things called statistical and methodological myths and urban legends uh, for a number of years. And I would encourage others to, to um, look into these because they also address a lot of the problems with respect to statistical analysis, research design, and then also propose a number of solutions as to how we can, uh, as editors and authors and scientists, overcome a lot of these. Um, I'd also like to add, too, that by watching this video and by reading our article, you are now soldiers in this revolution with a solution, and, uh, and therefore we expect you to abide by a lot of the advice that we have given you. So, uh, so let me go into another one of the issues that we addressed in the paper, which is doing research with a practical impact in mind. This issue addresses directly one of those external pressures we were talking about earlier, which is the, the external pressure from external stakeholders that we produce research that is actionable. Um, what we advocate in the article is a perspective proposed by Herbert Simon, uh, the recipient of the Nobel Prize, uh, that he labeled design science perspective. 
What is a design science perspective? He said that as social scientists, we have an obligation not only to describe what is, but also what can be. What does that mean? Well, in the field of medicine, for example, uh, researchers not only describe and try to understand cancer, but also try to find ways to cure or mitigate the negative impact of cancer. In engineering and other applied science, uh, researchers may be trying to create a better future in, for example, creating and designing more fuel efficient cars. What do we do as organizational scientists? For example, we could describe the effectiveness of a personnel selection system, but also, and, and theories to understand why and how the system works, but also think about creating a system that will be better. For example, a personnel selection system that will be equally as fair for members of all ethnic groups. So in our article, we offer several suggestions about how to go about doing that kind of research, which again, thinking about this kind of research means that you will do so way before you collect the data. For example, studying dependent variables that are important for many stakeholders, or measuring and manipulating independent variables that could actually be changed or manipulated by organizational decision makers. Things that could be actually changed in the form of an intervention in an organization, for example. If we study such independent variables and we find an effect on an important dependent variable, then that knowledge can be used to change uh, the world in a way uh, and work towards the betterment of society, organizations, and individuals. But in order to really, really um, carry out what Herman's suggesting though, we need to be very careful about the indiscriminate use of control variables that is going on in our field right now. Um, there are a number of uh, papers that we could read where the authors throw in um, a, a, a just a slew of control variables and you have to wonder in the end what it is that they've actually been studying and then making meaningful theoretical inferences from that outcome when basically what they have left over is a residual error term uh, that may or may not have any validity whatsoever. And so once again in the paper we talk about um, how to um, adapt some uh, very stringent rules in the sense of the control variable should have as much theoretical meaningfulness as the other variables in the, the uh, paper should not select control variables simply because another author did it or simply because a reviewer or editor told you to include it. In all cases, there should be a reason as to why that control variable is being included in a particular study. Well, to close, once again, we thank you for your time. We look forward to hearing from you about your reactions on our article. And also, we just touched upon only seven key issues that we believe are important. There are many more that we could have addressed, and we look forward to perhaps collaborating with some of you on producing such knowledge in the future. Thank and you. And remember, viva la revolution. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs>